first up, um, and I really lovely, love this lady's um, job title, Head of Force for Good. I think that's brilliant. I'd love that job title. Um, this is Emily Stevenson. She works for Innocent Drinks, uh, and she's going to be sharing some of the simple steps that every business can make to work uh, towards a more sustainable future. So please welcome Emily to the stage. As well as the uh, simple steps that I've been told, I think what people really like to hear is sometimes the things that don't always go too well. So I've entitled my bit Smart Calls, so some stuff that has gone well, and Screw Ups. Apparently the word screw up nearly got vetoed, I was just told, but I'm <coughs> glad it, it stayed there. And we can tell you a bit about our journey and hopefully there's some stuff in there that you guys can take. So I'll talk a bit about Innocent as it starts, the journey we've been on, our mistakes, and then opportunities for communication and collaboration in the area of sustainability. So first of all, um, you just mentioned my job title. I'm head up Force for Good in the UK, which sounds, and I appreciate, a bit like I've come out of Star Wars. The number of people who look at me and go, what the hell is this title? What do you actually do? Now, in reality, it's not that random because it's how B Corp, and I don't know how many of you know about B Corp here. I see quite a few nods. But it's a community of businesses who are trying to, as they say, use business as a force for good. And broadly put, they're trying to balance the profit that we all want to make being companies, but not doing it at all costs. So balancing people, planet, and profit. I can talk about B Corp for another two or three hours. I won't today, but it is a really interesting group of businesses. If you ever want to find out more, just Google them. Maybe not right now, but or ask me any questions. Anyway, so I've stolen the title, shamelessly, from B Corp, who want businesses to be a force for good, and therefore my role is heading up force for good. Really, it's uh, what you might have in your businesses, ESG, CSR, PACs, public affairs, communications, and sustainability. But in Innocent, really, um, there's all those things together. So I've been at Innocent for 17 years. This is me just a few months ago celebrating uh, my anniversary in ski gear. This was in the summer because it was a delayed Christmas party. So it's actually incredibly hot and really uncomfortable. And another thing that happens at Innocent when you've been there that long is you get your bust. It's really embarrassing, but people seem to like this story. Anyway, you get a 3D printer around you and you get a bust. So in the office, uh, there's a few of us now who have these. They're like this big. Um, they're not really glamorous. But anyway, this is a kind of random thing that the, that the business does. Anyway, without, um, without going too much into the detail of, of me, just a bit more about Innocent, that is a business that was started in 1999 by three friends who just wanted to make life a little bit better and a little bit easier. It was quite a vague brief, and they just wanted to do some business that would achieve this. So their first idea was completely revolutionary, and it was an electric bath. Uh, the idea was, okay, what's our problem? What's our insight? Oh, we go to work and we come home and we're so tired that we can't even put a bath on. Wouldn't it be amazing if that could be done even before we got home and we would arrive in our bathroom and could suddenly go into the bath? Now, they realized that actually having electricity and water would probably shorten people's lives as opposed to making it better. So luckily, their second idea had more merits, and this is the smoothies and the juices as we know them. What you might not know is that Innocent started really small at a jazz festival in Parsons Green in 1998, just before the company officially started, where the three founders got loads of fruit, about 200 pounds worth of fruit. They made smoothies and they had a big banner saying, should we quit our jobs to make smoothies, to make our living out of Innocent? And they asked people to vote with the bottles that they were drinking in. And at the end of the weekend, the yes bin was no, there were two bins, one yes, we should quit our jobs, no, we shouldn't. So there was market research as like the most, the most prominent kind of market research. There were a few no bottles and that was their parents. So who'd obviously said they didn't want their, their sons, it was three guys, to launch a business. Luckily they did and Innocent Today from a West London base is now sold in 20, over, over 20 countries. Um, England is still the heartland, but actually we're soon to be so we're competing um, in terms of growth with uh, countries like France and Germany and now launching in Asia. But I think the important part is really that from the start, and I've seen this in the 17 years that I've been in the company, what's called the philosophy has really been at the heart. So the purpose here is to make natural, delicious food and drink that helps people live well and die old, not like the electric bath, which have made them die young, um, to be the Earth's favourite little healthy food and drinks company. And we talk about the Earth here because we have always had a commitment to sustainability and thinking about the planet Earth at the heart. 
Um, and then with our values, being natural, entrepreneurial, responsible, commercial and generous, which are really living in everything that we do, from how we recruit people to, yes, they're on the wall, but they're really living, lived and breathed by the employees today. So all these things, actually, they are on our wall, but we talk about them <coughs> relentlessly. It can get a bit tedious sometimes, but at least the, the philosophy is really ingrained in employees. And I think that's probably one of my first lessons is just have whatever your vision, your purpose, whatever you want to call it, but just make sure that it lives and breathes through the people. Pretty obvious stuff, but it's not always the case. So a bit about our mistakes in the area of sustainability. So I think we always knew, it sounds a bit like we're Miss World, but we wanted to leave things a little bit better than we found them. And we say this, you know, it's not about completely changing the world, it's about what we do, doing it a bit better than, than what we did at the start. And to we drinkers, we talk about this idea of having little drinks, which is the drinks that we sell, and big dreams. And we always say that we take our drinks incredibly seriously, even though we don't necessarily take our own, ourselves very seriously, the drinks and the purpose, and that is really, really important to, to people. So we're, the way that we describe the way that we package up our dreams, and that's where my role comes in, is really in the areas of communities, uh, the planet, and the healthier people. So the communities is all the work that we're doing along the supply chain with the people who work from our farms to our, in our supply chain, but also obviously the people in our office. Healthier planet is our commitment to sustainability, and healthier people is all the work on nutrition. So again, I could go on about it for ages, but I'm going to talk about one particular thing here. I'm not going to talk about all these other areas which you can find out more about um, on, our, on our website with our sustainable factory that actually we've just launched with the first um, electric HGV, so they actually are really impressive. The Innocent Foundation, the big knits up there, you might recognize the little hats. So 25 cents of each of these hats sold goes to charity. Um, the B Corp uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, we've just recertify. You recertify every three years and we achieved a score that we deemed was Really, we're really proud of. Anyway, there's loads of stuff that I could be talking about, and I'm genuinely really proud, and it's the reason why I'm here still after 17 years. But in trying, we have made mistakes. Um, and one of the ones, uh, typically, which could be of interest to you, because it's about packaging, is when we launched what we call the first compostable bottle. So this was, gosh, this was about 14, 15 years ago. Um, and it was what we thought, generally, naively, was a compostable bottle. Uh, PLA. We've now then found out much more about it. And what we realized quite quickly after launching it is that actually it was only compostable, not in home compost, but also uh, in industrial compost. And now obviously these things are much more well known, but 15 years ago we were just trying out these things. Also, interestingly, it was for our little bottles that people consume on the go. So how were they even going to have a compost and how was it going to happen? But we tried, we put it out there, got loads of slack for it, but equally learnt and enabled us to dive into more of the, of the sustainability. Similarly, for our recycled, 100% recycled plastic, some of you might be fully aware of the challenges around that. We had 100% recycled plastic, again, 13, 14 years ago, which at the time wasn't such good quality plastic. So the yellow actually looked quite green because the plastic itself was blue, if that makes sense, the yellow of the drink. Um, and then we found out that actually have 100% recycled plastic, even though it sounds really good, in reality, because it's much more complex than that, isn't necessarily the right thing for the circular economy. Again, this isn't a, this isn't a talk about packaging, but it's just about things that we've done, that we've tried, that haven't necessarily worked. Um, but we still take pride out of them because we learned from them. And then the most recent one was having an ad banned from the ASA. So the ASA had this logo with a tick. And I've used my best PowerPoint skills to create a cross, because that was probably not the highlight of my career, even though it was an interesting time to be part of. Um, and taking a bit of a step back, thinking about greenwashing and how all of us communicate on sustainability. Interesting, and this is, um, this is a direct from the ASA, saying that the ASA has had environmental rules, and ASA, by the way, Advertising Standards Authority, uh, for those of you who don't know, has had environmental rules in the code for decades and ruling against misleading, socially irresponsible claims. However, what happened last year, early last year, they recognized needed to go further and faster in regulation of this because of the climate crisis and environmental concerns that everybody rightly has about it. So the ASA publicly said, we're going to go on a bit of a mission to make sure that all the ads that come out are as socially responsible as possible. Completely fair and the right thing to do. And there was quite a lot of guidance, and there is quite a lot of guidance on the different websites. The, the CMA is the Competition and Market Authority. They had... Green Claims Code, then ASA as well. There's a lot on their website. 
And initially, actually, the usual suspects had their ads banned. So this was the Guardian reporting a few, a few months ago. You know, the ones you'd expect to have greenwashed, in their words, Ryanair, Shell, BMW. This car was, um, was this ad for this car was, um, was banned because it claimed it was zero emissions, but actually it also had a, it was a kind of a hybrid car. It did have a, a motor, so technically it wasn't zero emissions. So it did go into quite a lot of detail. Um, but this is what I call the, the usual suspects, and I don't think there's anyone from those brands, but excuse me if they are, in, in the room. But then the ASA's attention turned to food and drink. So you had, and you probably know about this, uh, Alpo got banned, Oatly got banned, um, Lipton got banned for that 100% recycled plastic claim, which again is quite complex, but it didn't actually include their cap, so this was saying that they were misleading. And then um, we got banned, although our ad had been, uh, had been cleared by Clearcast, which is another authority that looks at ads. What the, uh, what the ASA said is that many consumers would interpret the overall presentation of the ad to mean that purchasing innocent products was a choice which would have positive environmental impact. So I'm not going to try and recreate the ad. Um, it was a little singing otter there with a guitar, singing along and using the words, oh, together we'll fix up the planet. And that was really what the ASA had a problem with. How is an otter with a guitar or how is Innocent making you know, juices and plastic bottles ever going to fix up the planet? Aren't you, you know, a bit up there with the fairies? Um, and the reality is, and I'd quite like to show the ad, but I've promised the ASA that I'd never show it again. And I just think if there's anyone from the ASA in this room, I don't want to have my, you know, my word taken. But, um, and I'm neither going to attempt to sing the song, but it was, a, it was a 30 second song about how Innocent could help fix up the planet. And the two different areas at play here, and this is why I think it can be really useful for you guys, is that we had aspirational future claims in there. And these are things like, we want to leave things better. We want to aspire to a world without waste, which is what Coca-Cola say. We're going to hit net zero by this time. Let's get fixing up the planet. Those things, if substantiated really, really clearly, if you've done your research, if you've done your homework, and when the ASA come, you can prove exactly how you're going to get to a world without waste, how you're going to hit, hit net zero. Let's get fixing up the planet is a bit harder, but if you're substantiated, you're probably just on the line okay, even though I probably wouldn't meddle with them. What's really hard to justify is what ESA describes as broad claims, which are things that are good for you, good for the planet, tastes good, does good, helps our planet, eco-friendly, all of those terms, really, if you think about it, from the moment that a business exists, from the moment that we're alive, even as humans, we're in effect, detrimental to the planet. So how could we then prove, we're trying to do our bit, we're doing everything that we can, we're wanting to leave things better than we find them, you know, all those things are okay, but saying you're helping the planet, and I see so many now, not just ads, but on product, you know, you walk down the street and it's all of this eco-friendly, it's a really complex world, and the ASA, rightly so, I think, are trying to, you know, crack down on, on people making those claims without them being substantiated. So generally speaking, it's really hard to be able to substantiate these kinds of claims. And so in the sustainability journey, absolutely start, so I'm saying, um, I'll just go back, start, yeah, start talking, but just be mindful of just, uh, of, of, what you're, of what you're saying and who's receiving it. Um, and I think our point is that after we got an ad banned, and I, fair to say, and we held our hands up, we said, yeah, actually, it's right. And, you know, we all over our social channels, we talked about it. We said, okay, we last year we made a TV ad with the singing otter, less silly than it sounds, about all the stuff we're doing about sustainability that the Advertising Standards Authority had told us didn't quite hit the mark. So we explained what we did in our ads, and then we said we deleted the ad, won't be on telly again. We still want to talk about the stuff we're doing on sustainability in the way that's really clear and transparent and work closely with the ASA and other brands to make sure this happens in the future. And then we finished off with saying, if anyone wants to hire Singing Otter, we know one who needs work. So trying to, without belittling the ASA and the impact of this, the ad ban, equally taking a distance to say, okay, put our hands up, but now what can we do together? Um, and this is at the same time as all kinds of, you know, weird and wonderful content that we put. This was uh, just yeah, a few weeks before we did um, one on, you know, how to, how to help your clock going back and all kinds of, of other weird and wonderful um, <clears throat> ways that we talk to our drinkers on social media. Also, a really important point on all of this when you're communicating on sustainability is engaging your workforce internally. Again, saying this is what happened, this is why I got the ad got banned, this is what you might hear from your friends down in the pub. 
this is what your grandma might tell you at the, you know, at the dinner table at Christmas. What does it mean and how do you make sure that you're as clear and transparent to your workforce for us is really, really important. Even though it wasn't an easy day standing up in front of everyone saying that the ad had gone banned, had been banned, um, I think it was an interesting one to, to be able to involve the whole company on the journey. And then after the Singing Otter, we had another campaign, which was called The Big Rewild, which actually was a success. I was uh, slightly fearful, to say the least, um, but we worked with quite a lot of lawyers, quite a lot of experts in this area to make sure that everything we talked around in this campaign, which was around, as the name suggests, rewilding um, and carbon offsetting. So we were, going, we were playing with fire because those are quite complex terms, but on our website, we had so much detailed information. We knew that what we were, what we were was strong and didn't get banned. Um, and again, sounds a bit cheesy, but collaboration, teamwork, exchange, asking questions, involving even the ASA, the CMA, this is how we're gonna get there, not by saying, you know, oh, we're gonna fix up the planet and running, because we don't necessarily have the, have the justification. So that was it, I was asked for a few um, tips. Don't know if I've got any tips, really, but try things, don't stand still, it's probably the main one. Uh, it might not always work, but as long as you learn from your mistakes. Communicate openly with your staff, on your website, on your social media. Welcome the questions and the debate. I think that's a really interesting one. We spend a lot of our time debating and questioning with internally, externally, whoever else is interested in these issues, and then gather the learnings to then share them at events like this, or even, you know, as I said, down the pub with your mates. It's often topics that people are really interested in. Um, and that's it, really. That's it for me today. Thank you. Thank you.